all, nearly all my money's out. I'm getting over 2,000 net a month and I'm outperforming the market by 20%. If you create the right spaces and you invest in that side of things, people will stay there because they love living there. Yeah. And so that will drive longer term occupancy. And didn't you get up to something like, a hundred, in a year, a hundred and thirty-five thousand pound profit per year ongoing from that twelve-month journey. So moving straight on to our next guest, hopefully going to be on Zoom. Uh, I want to see if Stuart is here because Stuart, uh, many of you will know Stuart. Ah, oh, good morning, Stuart. How are you? Good, thank you. Excellent. Uh, so Stuart, as you know, we're talking about HMOs and I've been talking about why people should have high-end HMOs and obviously that's Rob's plan, he's going to make it high-end. Uh, and you really are, are someone who's really pioneered the kind of the co-living concept, certainly here in the UK. And uh, I'd just love to have a little bit of a, uh, a talk with you. Let's go through one of your deals. I think you've got some slides of one of your case studies. And I just want to, to show people uh, the, uh, the kind of... Um, the, the kind of what we mean when we talk about high-end co-living, because I think people struggle to think, well, what's the difference between co-living and a normal HMO? And there's a, a world of difference, so maybe we can start off by talking about that. But before we do, sorry, um, can you just tell people a little bit about your background and your experience, please, Stuart? Yeah, sure. So uh, my background was I built and sold a number of companies. I built a product design company and an innovation company. And I'm based down in the South Coast, uh, down in Brighton and Hove, and I operate across the South Coast. I've got commercial, I've got residential, and I've got apart hotels as well. So I've kind of pivoted about eight years ago into full-time property development. And in that time, I started on the accelerator, went on Mastermind MM22, I think it was. And that really kind of like uh, accelerated my journey. So I, although I do a lot of residential conversions into coding HMOs, I also do commercial conversions into HMOs. And the case study that I'm going to share with you today is very similar to the last case study you saw in so much as there was a very key problem. And as Simon identified, you know, the, the deals that have the problems tend to have the best returns. And so that's the case study that I'm going to share. Great. And just before you do that, when we first met, I think when you came on, before you came on to accelerate our, our three day course, you were already making good money in property because you were finding properties and you were basically flipping them. You were, you were making them look amazing, selling them on for a profit, which was, is a good strategy. And a lot of people I meet, they think that's how you make money in property. You buy it, do it up and sell it. That's just one of probably about 16 different ways of making money. We're going to share all 16 ways later today, by the way. But the, the problem with that for me is that you can make some good money, but then you've got to go and do it again. You've got to find another one to flip. The thing I love about property, if you do it right, if you're holding it to rent out, is you work once, get paid forever. So you put the time and effort in up front, someone else can look after it, and you can get revenue every single month. And that was a, that was a major light bulb moment for you, wasn't it, Stuart? Yeah, it was. And I remember having a mentor at the time, and, and I was telling him about the flips that I'd done. I mean, obviously, I learned the foundations of adding value. And we'll talk about yeah. that in a minute on the case study. So it's all about adding value. You've got to remember, we've got to be developers first and then the product second. So I learned about adding value to, to maximize the end GDV. But of course, when I stepped out from my director role and I, I, you know, and I remember my mentor actually saying to me, um, and I think, I, think, um, I think you may have also mentioned it as well, Simon, that is, uh, well, that's, that's great, but now you've got no income. Because I'd sold every asset. You know, we worked so hard to get these assets that really, you know, having a blended portfolio where maybe you sell a few, but actually you've got to have a core portfolio. You've got to have that additional revenue stream. Yeah, absolutely. So look, let's go to the case. I think, um, I think you've got the slides. Do you want to share them on your oh, screen? Perfect. Let me just share mine. Control those. Yeah. Brilliant. I'll just share my slides here. Great. We can see those now. That's great. Excellent. Okay. So take great. it away. Okay. So, um, so unlike the last case study that you, you just covered, this one is a commercial to co-living HMO. I want to give you a slightly different perspective on different projects. Now, this, um, this was sourced via an agent relationship. So just to keep the key details on this one, I had a relationship with the agent that basically gave, gave me the nod that this was going to come onto market. I couldn't completely stop it from market, but I had an insight to the agent. So this is all about the relationship. Simon talks to you about setting up these really good relationships with agents. Most important thing, guys, is you get the phone call first. You want to be able to react quickly and get to site. Now, the key problem with this site and something that Simon identified on the last one, which is about sorting out problems. Um, well, firstly, this was a mixed use site. So not a lot of people knew how to 
how to finance it, how to deal with it. There was a lot of investors that looked at it, but, but couldn't actually work out how to finance it because it was more complex. Also, the seller wanted someone who had experience in, in being able to finance the project as well. Now, the key problem that scared off most of the HMO developers was that there was a title restriction restricting HMOs and apartments on this site. So imagine this is a commercial building with the shops with uppers. So it's on the high street, any other high street in any town or any city, um, but it had a title restriction. So now most people would have basically said, oh, well, I can't do HMOs, I'm not interested in it. And they walked away. Now I called my solicitor and being very solutions focused, I asked her to go digging I'm paid, I was happily paid for her time, go digging and find out who, who, who actually ha has the title restriction on the main title of, of, of the deeds. And what she found was it's an active company. It's not like a dormant company, it was an active company. So I opened a negotiation with that company and I agreed a price to remove the restrictions. And when I say remove the restrictions, I remo remove all restrictions so that I could do apartments, flats and HMOs, anything I wanted to do. So I managed to suddenly turn that into a decent site. The next thing that I did that was key to this, this process of getting a really good deal, similar to the last case study you saw, which, I think, which was a fantastic case study, by the way. So I then used cash. Now I know that some of you might not be able to use this, but remember this is just, I'm just sharing a technique that worked. I negotiated to buy this cash. Now that negotiated me another 60,000 pounds off the price. So I got BMV by using cash. It was a tool. Now, bear in mind, when I say the words use cash, I'm, what, I mean pure cash as well. I don't mean bridging. I mean pure cash. When I say I bought with cash, I wasn't intending to leave it as cash. I was going to swap it back out again afterwards. It was simply a tool to negotiate BMV mm. and then secure the property. So we'll come back to that. I'm sure. Uh, um, by the way, uh, that, just sorry to interrupt you. That's a hundred thousand pound idea you need to put down on your list, by the way. And you might think, well, yeah. I don't have cash. It doesn't have to be your cash still. Could be private exactly, investors, exactly. joint venture partners, but it is, cash is a very powerful four letter word that yes. can really motivate sellers. And, and often people think they need cash, but they don't. But in this case, it's a great example of how you can use that to negotiate. Yeah, and, and well spotted, Simon, yes, it, it wasn't my money. It, funny, I had some investor money I needed to put somewhere. And I used it to secure it. So firstly, I was able to remove a title restriction that was a problem. Then I paid with cash, negotiated the price all the way down, um, and, then, uh, and then swapped it out afterwards, which I'll come to in a sec. So the very next thing I did was I did prior approval on the building. So prior approval is a form of permitted development. It meant that I could have a scheme where I could create some apartments plus a small HMO. Now, it wasn't the exact scheme that I wanted to do, but that was my fallback position. I think, Simon, on the last case study, you talked about what is the worst case scenario. Yep. Well, my worst case scenario was a medium-sized HMO and also some apartments, which was a, still a very good deal. Now, what I did do is as soon as I secured this site cash I, with the discounted rate, I then put in a prior approval, which then which is just paperwork, it's just planning. So the prior approval went in, suddenly I bought the site for 240, uh, which was actually 215 plus what I paid for the title restriction. And then the site after I got prior approval, which was only eight weeks later, was suddenly worth on paper, and I hadn't done anything, 360,000. So it had gone up through prior approval and I was guaranteed the prior approval because I'd already checked that it met all the key criteria. Mm. Then simultaneously I did a full planning scheme. And the reason I do a full planning scheme is to get more density, to see if there's more that we can do with the building. Now, we don't need the full planning. We don't rely on the full planning, but I ran it in tandem with the prior approval, which basically means you've got to remember, you've got to get a fallback position, which is what Simon shared on the last, last case study. You get your fallback position that is safe and you're comfortable with, and then you can risk a full planning scheme as well, which is what I did. However, I did achieve the full planning scheme as well, which was for an eight bed sui generis co-living HMO. Sorry to, so I'll show one, you... sorry to interrupt one more time, Shep, but, that, but again, right. a tandem planning applications, that's another hundred thousand pound idea. Because yeah. what that means is that you've got, as you say, your worst case scenario, which you're happy with, 
but actually um, a better scenario. And you're not then having to waste time waiting for planning because you do them too simultaneously anyway. Sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make no, sure no, no, people no. are capturing all the golden nuggets you're sharing. There's one of the best ways of learning, guys, from real case studies rather than just the theory. So I'm, I do apologize. Please carry on. Yeah, no, that's um, it's what we call scheme design. So yep. basically the flat position is your safe position. And then the extra planning apps are kind of uh, to get you more density on the site. You're basically going to get a higher GDV and a higher cash flow from them. So I'll take you through what we, we created. So, well, this was this is what the site was originally, just to show you a before, before I show you the shot. So it was it was it was commercial on the ground floor, which you can see indicated on pink, and the existing upper floors across two floors was existing residential. Now, interestingly, when you usually look at commercial conversions, you assume that the uppers are not converted to resi. There are many opportunities where there is already resi above badly reconfigured. So there's opportunities with resi above and commercial below. So I'll show you what we converted it to and then I'll show you some numbers. So I know you like to see a little bit of a before and after. So this, these shots really show you how kind of commercial the building was because you know top left hand corner, you got the original shop, very commercial, all the windows. You can see in the bottom left, we started to fill in those areas of the old doors and then we completely transformed it through the building. Uh, we did some heavy insulation work to this building. We had to do soundproofing and everything else. However, we completely transformed the building into this. So we created this very high quality, as what Simon was saying, a high quality uh, co-living HMO that was designed with these large social spaces so that everybody could come together. They could socialize, they could eat together. Um, and, you know, there was soft seating, there was dining space, you know. So this was the main social space we had, which was about 25 square meters. So uh, it, I know different projects you look at will have different, different levels, but remember, don't forget to download your local HMO standards from the council uh, and also from planning as well. And then you'll know, roughly speaking, what sizes you need to comply to. So one of the things we did in this one which is quite good. You can see over on the left, we've got larder units. So unlike traditional under counters and wall units, uh, if you've got a bit more space to play with, you can give storage space, you know, uh, of larder units to tenants. Now, there's a small little detail. They're very thin units. You don't have to go to 600 wide, drop them down to fours, 400 wide, and you can get more in and everybody gets their own larder unit. It's completely private to them. So plenty of social space for them here. Just and one other on thing, I'd, I'd, sorry, just you made a really important point. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I just want to make sure everyone yeah. heard what you said, which is very important. When you're looking at minimum room sizes, and actually there is a distinction you need to understand. So when it comes to licensing a property, you often have bedroom minimum room sizes that came in in October 2018. But also from a planning point of view, they will have minimum communal spaces. And sometimes... The planning and the licensing, which are totally unset, uh, unrelated, they have different space requirements. So you quite rightly said, Shuk, you need to download both and understand space requirements of both of them to make sure you don't fall foul. And I just wanted to make sure everyone heard that. Yeah, and that's interesting. That's, that's a good one, Simon, because you know you could be converting something under permitted development, and well, really, you're just on licensing standards. But yep. you know, if I'm yep. putting in planning for, in this case, an eight-bed sewer generis, then strictly I'm on planning standards, not on yep. licensing standards. Correct. So yeah, very. Um, so let me just show you. So out, outside the front of the building, a number of the units on the ground floor, uh, we basically built in a whole load of private patios. So it, we kind of had this space and this land around the side. So we utilized it. We extended the rear of the property to get more another room. And we also built in these little patio spaces as well for some of the rooms. So remember, some of these rooms have private patios as well. So again, this is a real good selling feature. Um, and the bedrooms, I've just got a few bedrooms to show you. So this is one of the rooms up in the loft. Again, very difficult space to make work, but we did a lot of bespoke work. Um, Simon, you've seen, I, I think your team has, has been on been on one of our events and, and, and learned how to start to implement my, my latest refurb. I've done exactly everything you do, Stuart. You know, I've just copied it, copy and paste, right? Absolutely. And we rented <laughs> it really quickly for much higher rent. So, you know, yeah. And, and actually, you know, it was a key word I think um, you mentioned the other, the other day, Simon. I thought was a really good one, which is called, you know, what we do with co living HMOs. And this is, you know, something a, a phrase that Simon came up with it gives you a competitive advantage in the market yeah this design-led community-driven product 
unlike traditional vanilla HMOs, gives you a competitive advantage. Uh, here's another one of the rooms into, again, these are big rooms. This, in this particular development, most of the rooms are over 15 square meters. So think about the competition I've got in the, in the local area. You know, if I'm, if I'm competing against, you know, eight, nine square meter rooms, you know, all of my rooms are big. Every development we do, we, we target getting bigger rooms. Um, this is one of the rooms down on the ground floor. Again, I also put in extra seating areas that are away from the bed so that if you want to watch TV, you don't have to be uh, uh, sat on your bed. Also, small detail on the left of that one there, can you know, every room has a project station as well. So you do have areas, you've got co-working, you've got hot desks and spaces to work from home. Now, I know everyone's gonna to wanna to have a look at the numbers. So let's dive in here and then Simon can kind of, uh, kind of jump in as well. So we, we purchased this site for 240,000. We actually purchased it for less than that and then we paid the title restriction. So that 240 is the price of the site and the restriction. So that's actually, originally they wanted 600 for this site. So I negotiated that all the way down, sorry, they wanted 300 for the site. I negotiated it all the way down to 215 plus the lease extension, sorry, the lease uh, extension as well. So refurbishment was 171,000. So it was, it was a big refurbishment on this building. However, the most important number that means the most to all of us is the GDV. So, you know, this building, once it was finished was worth 630,000. So I've gone from a building that I bought BMV because of a because of a problem. I sorted out a problem. I bought it for 215. I then had the I had to remove the title restriction, which took it to 240, refurbished it for 171, end value 630, which basically means I recycled nearly all of my money. In fact, Simon, if it hadn't have been for COVID and the delays and the extra investor interest and all the other stuff, this would have been an all money out deal. But you know. Nevertheless, it still weathered the storm pretty well. So uh, gross rental, 57,000. So the, the building generates 57,500. My profit after all costs, and that includes uh, management and, and, and a provision for maintenance as well, over 24,000, which is basically over 2,000 a month. Uh, ROI, well, put it this way, all of the money's out halfway through the first year anyway. Now the market room average in that area is 506. And the co-living room average is 600, which means I'm outperforming, I'm outperforming local vanilla traditional HMOs by 20%. So the building's generous, so all, nearly all my money's out. I'm getting to over 2,000 net a month, and I'm outperforming the market by 20%. Amazing, amazing result. Who'd be happy with that, by the way, in the people in the room? Great. So, Stuart, this has been, a, an, again, a great case study full of really valuable golden nuggets, so thank you for that. Um, and obviously, we, um, we actually get you to help our people on our HMO training with you do a day all about um, uh, how to apply this kind of design. So thank you for that. Yeah. And I know our guys get a lot of value. All our masterminders go on that as well. Um, yeah. just, just thinking about mastermind, I know when you're on mastermind, I think, you were one of our top performers on that particular program. And, and didn't you get up to something like, a in a year, £135,000 profit per year ongoing from that 12-month journey? Yeah, it's about 100 years, 135000 uh, net profit in one calendar year. So, yeah, it was... Yeah, more than I was happy with. <laughs> so yeah. I was very happy with the results. Yeah. Well, it says... Um, I, and I just want to show an extra slide. If we go back to my slides, please, guys. Um, because... Um, uh, you know, just, just to summarize what you said about why we should do high-end HMOs, that, you know, there is a lot of competition out there, and I think in most areas there's an oversupply of HMOs, but what we're, we're not competing with all the other HMOs here. We are looking no. for those more discerning tenants who, who want a bit more space, who want better quality, and they're prepared to pay a higher price. We have lower void periods, and because it's not just a room and a house, they're part of this community, they actually want to stay longer, don't they? Yeah, well, that's the, I'm glad you've mentioned that, Simon. So there's two parts to this. One, we can create a great product. That's about being competitive in the market. That attracts tenants in. That gives us, that fills the rooms. But to retain tenants, to retain them as housemates and customers, yeah. that's where you're focusing on the experience and the spaces themselves, because that will drive longer-term occupancy. So when we create these exterior spaces, community spaces and everything else, 
if you create the right spaces and you invest in that side of things, people will stay there because they love living there. Yeah. And so that will drive longer term occupancy. And, and one of those really simple things to do, that I think, as I mean, those patio ideas are great. But, you know, what I'm doing in, in my HMOs is, is really trying to transform the outside space, which most landlords, myself included, don't really do. I mean, I put a nice patio and a bench out and that was probably it, you know, whereas actually now you, you use, uh, you know, different seating areas, built in barbecues, covers, uh, you know, graffiti to make it look uh, great. And, and it's just yeah. it's just a just taking the thinking to another level. And again, it's great being inspired by the people and seeing what they do and realizing you might think that everybody does this, and in our community, a lot of people sign to it. But our community is very, very small compared to the two million landlords out there. Most landlords aren't even aware of this, and even if they are, sometimes they're not mm. bothered to do it. So it, it doesn't take much to be the best quality accommodation in the area, I, I believe. Absolutely, and you're, you're entirely right. That over 90% of your competition is going to be below average. And yeah. most landlords are not going to adapt to this change. Yeah. So the fact that that you know you're here and you're 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 you know you're you're creating a better quality product, all you've got to do is continually move forward. You cannot stand still in this market. Yeah, you have to be continually moving forward. And as as um, you know, the term that, that that Simon came up with, competitive advantage. You know, I don't know about anyone else, but if I'm spending hundreds of thousands of pounds on assets and I'm putting them into locations that I'm going to have for decades, I want to have a competitive advantage. I want to yeah. guarantee. I've got demand. I want to guarantee that I've got occupancy. And we do this through, through focusing on the product and the experience. And I think there's a huge opportunity right now and probably for this next year of finding some of these tired landlords who have this very average or below average accommodation where the rents are not very high, the value is not great, and we can buy those. And, and sometimes they might already be set up. They might already be compliant, as Rob's was. It's, his is compliant. But actually, for a relatively small spend, cosmetically and some great furniture, we could take what's an average HO mode and make it a really high-end HO mode and, and really get this higher rent, this lower voids, and these tenants are going to stay longer. So, so don't think you have to go and buy. They, they could be a purchase option. You know, it, there are lots of ways of doing this, aren't there? Yeah, and actually, just to touch on that, where high-end high doesn't mean expensive refurb. So yeah. just just so everyone realizes that you know you can because some some people look at some of my, my projects and they think they're all in a blue collar area or sorry in a white collar area but in fact I invest across across you know the uh, uh, you know the, the more expensive areas and and the lo and and the areas of regeneration and in fact if I showed you the photos you probably think they were all very similar but the difference is <clears throat> the materials we use and the per square foot fit out costs are completely different yeah. on different areas so it's all proportional. So it means you can still invest in creating the best product in a, in a blue collar area as you would do in a white collar area as well. So uh, it's creating a high quality product doesn't mean that there's high end pricing to create it. It's just creating a proportional product. So as Simon identified, you're operating in the top 10%. Yeah. And obviously we, again, I want to, everyone to really open their mind here. We talked a lot about HMOs which is not the only strategy, it's a great strategy, but you know, Dolph Drews, I'm not sure if you were on yesterday, Stuart, we had Dolph Drews speaking, and he was talking about some serviced accommodation units they're doing, and they were theming them, and they had like Club 55, and they had like a disco ball in there, and a wall that said Albus, so all your concepts you can take and apply to serviced accommodation as well, it's just about that design, isn't it? Yeah, and in fact, as you, as you know, Simon, we've got two apart hotels yes, down indeed. in Central Brighton, which gives us a approximately um, 20, 23 units across the, uh, uh, on, the, on the beachfront of, of Brighton. And we, we applied the same thinking. We, we had to understand the customer. We created the best product in the market. And then we focused on experience. The only yeah. difference really between service accommodation and, and coding HMOs is, you know, if, if we didn't focus on experience with, with the apart hotels, we wouldn't get reviews and we wouldn't get bookings and, and our, our, you know, our revenue would be down. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately with service accommodation, your, 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 your end valuations are intrinsically linked to your performance. So we have to focus on experience. Yeah, fantastic. Sure, there's so much great information you shared. Really appreciate this. Um, thanks so much for coming on and, and well, well done with the projects. And, and I know you've got some interesting stuff coming up. So good luck with that. And we'll speak very soon. Let's, let's thank Stuart Scott, please. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs>
I do hope you got massive value from watching this YouTube video. I'd encourage you to click on the link below to come and do the online training with me. And I've got another video lined up for you, which I think is also going to be really useful that you should watch once you've registered for the online training with me. So invest with knowledge, invest with skill. I'll see you very soon.